Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program about Lady Bird Johnson, featuring Julia Swag, author of the new biography, Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs that you can view on our YouTube channel. On Tuesday, March 16th at 1 p.m., Heather Cox Richardson will be here to tell us about her new book, How the South Won the Civil War. While the North prevailed in the Civil War, ending slavery and giving the country a new birth of freedom, Richardson argues that democracy's victory was ephemeral, as the system that had sustained the defeated South moved westward and established a foothold there. And on March 30th at noon, author Dorothy Wickenden will discuss The Agitators, which uses the intertwined lives of Harriet Tubman, Martha Wright, and Frances Seward to tell the stories of abolition, the Underground Railroad, and the early women's rights movement. This program is presented in partnership with the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library, and we thank them for their support. You may order the book, Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight, through the library's website. Julia Swag tells the story of this remarkable first lady through Lady Bird's own words. We're fortunate to have Mrs. Johnson's audio daily diary recorded on 123 hours of tapes preserved at the LBJ Library, which is one of the 14 presidential libraries administered by the National Archives and Records Administration. These recordings, which the library has made publicly available on its website, allows us to hear firsthand how Lady Bird was the president's most trusted advisor. She took an active interest in politics and was a tireless first lady. The audio diary is truly a remarkable historical source. Listening to Mrs. Johnson's soft, calm voice, you can imagine yourself in the room with her. It is rare to have such a detailed record of history created on the spot. This new book, as well as Swag's podcast, deservedly brings Lady Bird's story to a larger audience. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. The moderator is author, historian, and former White House speechwriter Jeff Sheshel, author of Mutual Contempt, Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, and the feud that defined a decade. Joining him is Julia Swag, author of Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight. She did extensive research at the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, where our final panelist, Claudia Anderson, was once the supervisory archivist and is very knowledgeable about the library's archival holdings. Thank you for joining us today. Julie is a longtime senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's been a leader at the Aspen Institute, and she is today a senior research fellow, appropriately enough, at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'll just add that Julie is a friend. She's a neighbor here in Washington, um, and as the author, uh, as mentioned of a, a book about LBJ myself. I've been eager for this book to come out for years, ever since Julia first told me uh, a little bit about what she was uncovering at the Johnson Library. And now we have the, the fruits of that in this, in this fantastic book. I'm thrilled that the book is here. I'm thrilled that it's already getting the reception that it, that it deserves. And uh, I'm thrilled as we'll discuss that people really seem to, to understand the point at the very center of this book, which is that Lady Bird and by extension, her husband, Lyndon Vance Johnson have been underestimated for a long time. So we'll be talking about that. And a little bit later, um, we'll also tell you about the podcast that Julia is hosting called Simply In Plain Sight. Uh, I'm on episode three, uh, and not to get ahead of the run of show here, but the podcast is beautifully produced and absolutely gripping. Uh, just to hear Lady Bird uh, speaking for herself, which of course is, is the whole uh, notion of this book. I'm also here to introduce Claudia Anderson, uh, speaking of the University of Texas. Uh, uh, Claudia is a, a graduate of that university and, and has been one of the people most responsible for one of the jewels in the crown of, of UT, uh, and that is the LBJ Presidential Library. Claudia, as uh, was mentioned, is the former supervisory archivist at the library, which, if anything, understates her role. Uh, she joined the staff actually just two months, I think, after the end of the Johnson administration and has shaped the library and the incredible work it does in, in countless ways over the years. In 2016, Claudia, Claudia began something uh, I'm told is, that's called phased retirement. Um, and what that seems to mean to me, given how busy she is, is, is non-retirement. 
Um, I got to know Claudia myself back in the, in the mid nineties when I was working on my book. And I, I was, I remember sitting Claudia in your office and I was awed then I am awed still by your incredible knowledge of the Johnson presidency, right down to every last tape, every last document. So we'll, we'll be talking about all of this. Um, so thank you both. Um, so let's, Julia, let's jump right in. Um, again, congratulations on, on the coverage and on the, the rave reviews already for the book. Um, I'd love for you to begin by, by talking to us about this phrase we heard earlier that you, you've called Lady Bird Lyndon Johnson's most trusted advisor, most trusted political advisor, which really is not how most of us, uh, and I'll cop to this myself, it's not how most of us have thought of Lady Bird. Um, how did we all miss that? And uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to that surprising view, which is, is so well documented in your book? Well, thank you very much to the National Archives and to Claudia for joining us here tonight. I share Jeff's uh, delight in being able to share this discussion with you. And Jeff, thank you very much for agreeing to, of course, read the book, which is a heavy lift when you have your own work to do, but also to think with me as I was writing it about its approach and to, of course, lead the way with your own work. I'm very happy to be here with all of you tonight and for those of you that are joining us. Um, I came upon the idea of Lady Bird Johnson as LBJ's closest advisor by taking such a deep dive into listening to her diaries, reading the transcripts, and also doing all of the kind of contextual research and reading that one has to do to be able to understand the LBJ presidency on the one hand, but also to take her material and her account of her own experience of that presidency and put her in the center of the room in a sense. And since she is telling us through her diaries and also through the other material in the archives, in the library and in other archives about her participation in discussions about civil rights, about her campaigning, of course, all over the country in elections uh, in the South for civil rights, about their numerous and very difficult, extensive discussions about Vietnam throughout the presidency about her orchestration of the transition after the JFK assassination into the White House, her campaigning with him and separately for the Great Society programs. I mean, the whole arc of the presidency and then of course her orchestration of his exit from the presidency showed me that especially once the Johnsons lost Walter Jenkins, that she really was of all of the people in the West Wing and all of the people in his administration, the person that he most trusted, whose judgment he went to repeatedly um, over and over again. So that's why I concluded that, that she was his closest and most trusted advisor. Longest lasting, certainly. Absolutely. Uh, now, not to get ahead in the narrative here, but you talked about uh, Lady Bird helping to orchestrate his exit from the presidency. And the reason I'm willing to jump ahead in the narrative is because you describe this as something that was actually set in motion surprisingly early on by Lady Bird. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so in May of 1964, there, um, there's a moment in, this is now only five months after they've come into the White House after the JFK assassination, Lyndon Johnson is facing pressure to escalate in Vietnam. Civil rights is stuck in the Congress. The legislation hasn't really picked up yet, May of 1964. And, and he, despite having very, very high approval ratings, is looking ahead to the November election and asking himself whether he's going to be able to sustain the narrative and the actual um, material achievements to keep the country unified and if he does win election to keep it unified after that. And he asks Lady Bird to lay out a, a memo for him, a pro and con analysis about the merits of stepping out versus running again in, 19, in November. 
And she does that in May of 64. And it's a document that's in the library and that very explicitly says, here's the pros, here's the cons. Of course, I'm gonna summarize here and we're gonna talk about that document a little bit later. But she says explicitly, you know, you ought to run, you'll probably win. And then in February or March of 1968, you can announce that you won't run again for an additional term. And of course, on, Mar on, May on March 31st, 1968, we're almost at that anniversary, he announces that he won't, he will do precisely that, that he will not be standing again. And I thought that that was read against the background of her entire diary and especially starting in 1967 where she revs up her campaign with him and her work to get this issue front and center and on the front burner. You can see very clearly the thread going back all the way to the, the beginning months of 1964. It's it's a fascinating memo, and I, I urge everyone to read the book, <laughs> which replicates it essentially in full. Um, it, it is amazing to see Lady Bird with love, but also with the shrewdness of any political advisor, laying out the case, the pros and the cons, and and then you know putting putting a thumb on the scales for the outcome that, that she believes is, is in his best interest and is the country's best interest. Um, which, which raises another question that I, I have for you. And, and that is, um, I mean, he, here was a case where, where Lyndon Johnson was clearly taking her advice, both in 1964 and then subsequently in 1968. And, you know, I've thought a lot in reading your book about Eleanor Roosevelt, um, you know, clearly the model for an influential first lady. Eleanor Roosevelt tended to play out her influence very much in public. She was such mm -hmm. a public figure, taking stands on issues as well as behind the scenes. And um, now FDR, as we know, didn't always think that Eleanor Roosevelt gave him the best political advice. She often did. Um, sometimes he thought she didn't. Sometimes he was right. Sometimes he was wrong. Um, but he valued her perspective enormously, um, and, and he understood it was different. From his own. I, I guess my question for you, after having surveyed the whole of the Johnson presidency and, and, and gotten so deep into their relationship and her advice, did she give good political advice? Um, and did Johnson think so on the whole? Well, there, you know, despite having waded through so much material, one can't know the full, the full picture because we are also talking not only about a political partnership, but about a marriage. So as far as all of the like, advice she may have given him, of course, I don't know whether it was all good. Um, in the areas related to this, you know, the entry and the exit, I, I think most certainly she did. I think as far as um, his perspective, you know, you can look in his memoir and he writes about her here and there and, and often a great deal. And he refers to her quite admiringly all the time. He never really comes out and says on X issue, I disagreed with her entirely. Um, I think the area in which she was very strong with him, which you can see in terms of his, what his administration did is with the environment. I think the air in a very positive sense. And of course she was promoting in a public way. I mean, that, her environmental ambitions and agenda were very extensive and amplified very much what his administration's agenda was. But as far as Vietnam goes, I mean, one would have to say, looking backwards and not being in their shoes, that the advice that she appears to have given him on Vietnam was to reinforce his decision making. And she did that from what I can tell until about the end of 1967, when he himself was already beginning to, to have a shift. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that. But generally, I think she shared his blinders when it came to Vietnam. She shared his sense of being stuck, of not having options, of feeling a lot of domestic political pressure to escalate and was oriented around the experience of World War II as he was, in which you know, the idea of a Munich or if somehow, you know, a, a betrayal really haunted them. And that's how they talked. One of the things that I, I thought was fascinating um, 
uh, in, in the book was Lady Bird's estimate that in, I think it was 1966, that two thirds of the conversations between the two of them, between Lady Bird and LBJ concerned Vietnam, uh, which on, on the one hand isn't all that surprising and that it was an issue that was dominating, you know, the, the discussion in the country, but, but this is within a marriage and the fact that uh, they spent by her, again, by her estimate, two thirds of the time talking about Vietnam, I think speaks to the fact that this was a, not just a, a loving relationship, but this was a very substantive relationship and that Johnson was turning to her for, for her views on, on substantive issues without question. And just, and just Jeff, if I just to go back to that May 64 memo, there Vietnam is very much part of the context too for her. She writes explicitly about the pain that she anticipates he and she will feel, but especially he will feel when and if he has to start sending young American boys off to war. So it's, it's, it's a huge part of, of their life and their consciousness and the substance of what they discuss. And she's involved tangentially and in the room often when he's discussing it with his staff and with his war council. Now you mentioned uh, the environment, and um, I think no discussion of Lady Bird would be complete if we didn't talk about the beautification campaign. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. And um, your suggestion, I think, in the book that the beautification um, maybe was um, was a label that um, I mean I don't want to I don't want to go too far in suggesting this, but did they regret the label beautification for any reason? Oh, I don't think it's a problem for you to go too far in suggesting it. I, I, I mean, I don't know about regret per se, but you know, there's this wonderful quote from her when she was in her 80s where she says, I'll never forgive Lyndon's boys for making me use that word, but I did it anyway, because I understood sort of as a political statement that at that time, it was, it was about as far as they could go. It was a kind of feminized way of and demeaning, but she did it anyway because she said she understood that if people liked flowers, they would care about the land that grew them, um, which isn't to diminish wildflowers in any way, but she, by the end of, again, sort of you see an evolution for her. The, the beautification program itself by 1966 begins to take on real substance beyond planting flowers in um, public Washington and touristy Washington and monumental Washington. She begins to try to find ways to bring together civil rights and social justice and environmentalism, what we would call environmental justice in Washington, DC and more broadly in American cities, with the idea of bringing democratic access to nature for the most underserved people living in American cities who are frequently people of color. Um, but she herself start her staff in 1967 starts sending out notes across uh, her communications that says, please stop using the word beautification. Mrs. Johnson doesn't want to use that word anymore. She wants to talk about conservation and the environment. And by 1968, she talks about it as that rather inadequate word that has much more substance behind it. I wonder if, if we can, um, if we can turn back for a moment to the Eleanor Roosevelt example. And um, one of the things that I find so interesting about Lady Bird is that um, she doesn't hew to a particular model of the first lady. I mean, she seems to have found uh, or created her own model, which was different than Eleanor Roosevelt for some of the reason, reasons that I mentioned earlier. And it was certainly different than, than the woman she succeeded, Jacqueline Kennedy. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about Lady Bird's understanding of the public role of the first lady and um, you know, where she saw herself kind of on this continuum of remaining wholly in the background, you know, maybe Eisenhower, for example, mm -hmm. or Bess Truman, um, or, or being more public and more engaged on the issues uh, like somebody like Eleanor Roosevelt. Where did she see herself kind of fitting in? I'm not a historian of all of the first ladies of the United States, but I know that Lady Bird saw herself as a descendant of Eleanor Roosevelt. She was an FDR Democrat as LBJ was in terms of the, the vision that the two of them 
had and felt that they inherited from the Roosevelt's regarding deploying the services and resources of the federal government to help the body politic and to build a social contract and to bring bring up and to level the playing field for those most most vulnerable. That was their perspective. And when she was a young congressional spouse in the 1930s, she was going into Washington alleys with Eleanor Roosevelt and going to the White House and attending activities with Eleanor Roosevelt. So I see very much a direct line between the two of them. And I think she saw it too. And, and it's true that she wasn't as public as Eleanor Roosevelt. She didn't have a column. She, she wasn't traveling around the world. I mean, she wasn't in the White House for as long as Eleanor Roosevelt was either. But I think she, she had, and now I'm going to jump to Jackie, precisely because she understood that there was no way she could fill Jackie's shoes. You know, she didn't have the glamour or the youth or the beauty or the kind of, you know, the glitz and the sizzle that Camelot and the Kennedys brought to the White House. And that in some ways, I think, really freed her to figure out how to use this platform. She talks about, you know, understanding that she has a platform and needs to figure out how to use it. And for about the first year until LBJ was elected at the end of 64, she dabbled a little bit more and didn't take the deep dive into the environmental agenda as as comprehensively until afterwards. Um, she was the uh, maybe arguably the first modern first lady. She had a professional staff. She had policy aides. She had a chief of staff. She had a very active press operation. She had to fight to get a, a budget, which she didn't originally have, so that her staff could travel around. She had a political operation that reinforced and backstopped and worked hand in glove often with the West Wing's political operation. So what she didn't do, however, was publicize that, right? There was a a, a, a screen where what we saw in, in the First Lady and Lady Bird Johnson was the beautification stuff and a lot of ceremonial and campaigning stuff. We didn't really see, and this is what's the beauty of these, among the beauty of these tapes is is how interconnected the East Wing and West Wing were. I mean, you could call it Lady Bird Land, right? A la Hillary Land. Um, it was a political operation, and the person that ran that with Lady Bird was, of course, Liz Carpenter, her yeah, chief of was, staff, and and was, her. And sorry. I was sorry, just going to say who Liz Carpenter was, who was her chief of staff and her chief press aide, and had been a journalist in Washington for many decades, and was a. a uh, had started out on Lyndon staff and was a Texan and a, a very powerful and and intelligent and, and brilliant woman who was one of the only people from what I can tell who had the ability to uh, go back and forth between East Wing and West Wing and between the two Johnsons and really get things done between the two of them. I think that's absolutely right. She was a force and she was so well respected by by both Johnsons and so valued by both of them. Um, and you mentioned the tapes a, a minute ago. Maybe this is a good time uh, to hear a little bit about the podcast. I think we've got a, a trailer or a teaser uh, of the podcast that we can that we can run here. I'll just tell you just before we play it so yeah. people understand what they're listening to is that um, this is something that I produced with my production partners at Best Case Studios that ABC News has been releasing over the last few weeks and this week we're in episode four it's eight episodes it's i think of it as a eight episode audio documentary it's really a deep dive very immersive into the period and into the johnson presidency told with my narration and lady bird johnson's tapes and a bunch of other contemporary contemporaneous archival material what we're going to play because we couldn't decide what snippet to play for you and hope that you'll go ahead and listen to the whole thing is the trailer. So you'll get a teaser and an overview of the story from this trailer. It all began so beautifully. We were going into Dallas. 
Inside a dimly lit room at the LBJ Library in Austin, Texas, a motion sensor triggers a recording and a soft, deliberate voice fills the room. In the lead car, President Mrs. Kennedy, and then a Secret Service car, and then our car, Lyndon and me. It's the voice of Lady Bird Johnson, the wife of Lyndon Johnson. We were rounding a curve. Suddenly, there was a sharp, loud report. A shot. I was so struck by that voice and the detail she managed to capture. I needed to know more about what I was hearing. I cast one last look back over my shoulder. Saw Mrs. Kennedy lying over the president's body. So I decided to dig deeper. I'm Julia Swig. I've lived in Washington, D.C. for a while, working in policy and writing about history. D.C. is a town that's focused mostly on power and influence. Now, there have certainly been some powerful, influential women in the White House, Eleanor and Jackie, Hillary, Michelle. But Lady Bird Johnson? As history has it, she's just a president's wife, best known for a program called beautification. But turns out, Lady Bird recorded her entire experience in the White House, hours and hours of tape that almost no one has ever heard. And those tapes? They end up rewriting history. Of course, the 1960s have been poured over and dissected. But what I found in these diaries is surprising. It's new. Give me Ms. Johnson right quick. Yes, Mr. President. I wrote out for Lyndon about a nine-page analysis. This is a story about the power of a political partnership, one that somehow doesn't show up in the many, many accounts of LBJ's presidency. During the statement, there was too much looking down, and I think it was a little too fast. I'd say it was a good B+. plus. How do you feel about it? I thought it was much better than last week. A partnership well, she recorded as she and Lyndon tried to navigate the turmoil of the 1960s. From political upheaval... Most of them carried signs that said, Lady Bird, beautify Vietnam. Senator Kennedy has been shot. ...to race riots. Chicago's west side is a patchwork of violence, rock throwing of... views of Dr. King's assassination. ...to her complicated relationships with other key people from the time. Bertha Kitt, whose outburst yesterday... At a what White I said House. to Mrs. Johnson upset her? I don't know why it should upset her. I was telling her the truth. I found myself in front of Mrs. Jacqueline. And Kennedy. I felt extreme hostility. Was it because I was alive? No, I just don't believe that I have the physical and mental strength to carry the responsibility. There was much talk of the big question. He wants to get out. There is no way out. As for that thing she's best remembered for, that program they called beautification. I think you also know what lies beneath that rather inadequate word. It goes a whole lot deeper than we ever knew. From Best Case Studios and ABC Audio, this is In Plain Sight. This season, I'm looking at the untold story of Lady Bird Johnson, a canny political operator, an activist, one of the most influential members of the Johnson administration, even if we never saw it. Subscribe to In Plain Sight, Lady Bird Johnson, wherever you listen to podcasts. And look out for our first two episodes on March 1st. Great. And you got little snippets there, of not only of Lady Bird recording her diary entries, but also some conversation between Lady Bird and the president, which I want to talk about in a second. Um, Claudia, I wondered if you can mention the extent of the volume of material, both the transcripts and the, the, the hours of recording. And if you could walk us a little bit about what what it is like to try to process materials like that and how long it takes. Well, I think uh, we estimate about 123 hours of recording and Mrs. Johnson recorded the diary on three inch reels. She used pretty inexpensive tape um, and she didn't always uh, record at a very good speed. She used the slowest speed often uh, we don't know if that was to save money or exactly <laughs> why, but um, it didn't make the best sound reproduction. Uh, when the tapes first came to the library, they were reproduced, but actually that preservation copy turned out to not hold up as well as the original tapes did. So we then did new preservation copies in about 2008 
and that was sort of the start of processing uh, this material to make it available to the public. And then we began a review of the, uh, the transcripts. And my memory is that the transcripts fill about 12 boxes, uh, manuscript boxes, and that um, it took us uh, several years to go through the material, describe it, and eventually make it available. And as I mentioned, what we made available was a transcript that Mrs. Johnson had edited. The original tapes were transcribed in the White House by White House personnel. The people who transcribed them were um, not familiar with foreign names. They didn't know Mrs. Johnson's friends and sometimes didn't understand her East Texas accent. So there were a lot of uh, transcription errors in the original transcript. In the 70s and 80s, Mrs. Johnson actually went through uh, most of the transcripts and uh, with an eye toward editing them. And when I say edit, I don't mean taking out material. What she did was to add punctuation, correct a lot of spelling errors, and in some case, add clarifying remarks uh, to the diary. And it's those edited transcripts that we make available on our website today. And so this is in addition to what we know of as the Johnson tapes, his, his recordings of uh, telephone conversations and some meetings in the Oval Office and so forth. And, um, and I think that um, we've got, a, a, you heard a, a tiny little bit of it in the podcast trailer, mm -hmm. and we're going to hear a little more of it now. I wonder, Claudia, can you tell us um, uh, what, what we have here, what we're about to hear? Uh, this is a con about to see. Yes, it's a conversation that was recorded uh, in the president's by the president's staff, and it's the president and Mrs. Johnson. She's uh, critiquing a press conference that he had earlier in the day. It's March seventh, nineteen sixty four. This is only three and a half months after he assumed office, and while the tape is playing. Uh, the notes that she took while she listened to the press conference are appearing on the screen. And you'll notice uh, it's so soon after uh, he assumes office, they're still using Office of the Vice President uh, stationery. The notes have that letterhead. And up in the corner is a B plus, which is the grade that she gives the president. So if you wanna go ahead and play. You want to listen for about one minute to uh, yes, uh, my critique, or would you rather wait till yes, tonight? Yes, ma'am. I'm willing now. <laughs> um, I thought that you looked strong, firm, and like a reliable guy. Your looks were, were splendid. The close-ups were much better than the distance ones. Well, you can't get them good. To, uh, well, well, I would say this. They were more close-ups than they were distance ones. Uh, during the statement, you were a little breathless. And it was too much looking down, and I think it was a little too fast. Not enough change of pace. Uh, a drop in voice at the end of sentence. Um, there was a considerable pickup in drama and interest when the questioning began. Uh, your voice was not noticeably better, and your facial expression was noticeably better. I think the outstanding things were that the close-ups were excellent. Uh, you uh, need to learn, when you're going to have a prepared text, you need to uh, 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 have the opportunity to study it a little bit more and to read it with a little more uh, conviction and interest and change of pace. Uh, well, the trouble is that they criticize you for taking so much time. They won't use it all for questions. And their questions don't produce any news. If you don't give them news, we catch hell. So my problem was trying to get through before 10 minutes, and I still ran 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And I took a third of it for the questions. And I could have taken, if I'd have read it like I wanted to, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what to cut out. Maybe I ought to cut out Mary's heart name. But uh, I thought that every place one of those names dropped, they'd call up the fellow and ask him about it, and he'd get his name in the paper, and then publicize it good, and it helped Mm -hmm. I believe if I'd had that choice, I would have said uh, uh, use uh, 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 13 minutes or 14 uh, for the statement. Um, in general, I'd say uh, it was uh, a good B plus. How do you feel about it? 
I thought it was much better than last week. Well, uh, I, I heard last week, see, and, and didn't see it and, and didn't hear all of it. Uh, and, and, and at any rate, I felt uh, sort of on safe ground. I mean, like you had sort of uh, gotten over a, a hump psychologically and in other ways. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear everybody else's reaction. Read it with a little more conviction and interest. <laughs> yes. There weren't too many people <laughs> who got to speak to LBJ that way, and um, no. let alone get a yes, ma'am, in, in response. It's a pretty incredible recording. Well, and one of the really interesting things about audio records that you don't get in a paper record is that uh, there's this intangible relationship between the speakers that you hear, and uh, you can certainly hear. Mrs. Johnson's affection and support for the president in that telephone conversation. And Claudia, you've got, I think, one more image that you wanted to share with us and tell us a little bit about. Uh, can we get that one on the screen? Uh, this is Mrs. Johnson uh, recording her diary. She would actually record several days at one time. And you can see the envelopes that are propped up against the back of the couch. Um, she would save agenda, menus, uh, invitations, notes, and file them in these envelopes by day. And she would often record several days at one time using the material from the envelopes to jog her memory and to kind of flesh out her diary. Uh, she would sit in her office. Uh, this is off of her bedroom. It's the room that Mrs. Kennedy used as a dressing room. And uh, she said it was one of her favorite places in the White House. Uh, she said she liked to work about sunset because her staff would have gone home and the president was still busy in the Oval Office. Uh, so you can see her here. Um, I think it's interesting that she took steps to, to have a photographer document that she did this. It is fascinating. I mean, I mean, she's she's documenting the presidency and then she's documenting the the documentation of it. Um, and yet at the same time, um, so much of this um, to use, uh, Julia, your phrase, and we'd love to get you to jump back in here. So much of this was was hiding in plain sight. Yes, some of this was closed. And yet um, there was enough out there, wasn't there that that we should have we should have known uh, at least more of uh, what you've revealed to us here in this book. Can you talk a little bit, Julia, about you know, wh why did we miss this for so long? Just to bring it back to something that we raised earlier <clears throat> in the conversation. Right. Thank you. Um, I loved listening to that tape just now. And also, it not just it doesn't just show, I, I will ask you, answer your question, but I just want to add that it doesn't just show her affection and trust for him. And, and, and it shows his uh, reliance on her, right? You can hear that this is something they've been talking about for a long time, that he's working on, that they're working on together. This feedback is about the two of them kind of building their muscles as public figures in the presidency. And so, and this is early days. He's going to her. I don't know if he went to anybody else who would give him that type of sort of feedback, as you heard. Um, why was all of this material missed? You know, it's a question about the field of presidential historians and how presidencies are written about. They're written about with a focus on the individual president primarily. And after that, perhaps his national security staff and closest Oval Office advisors. I think it's, of course, the case that the American presidency has been occupied by a male president. And so the, the gender bias is just baked into the way we have been telling the story of the American presidency. It's very focused on the president. Um, Lady Bird's case of why we missed this is a little harder for me. I mean, it's true that the material, the full unredacted released audio and transcripts hasn't been out there fully until 
the process was completed, I think in 2016 or 17, but it's been coming out. And, and as I, I wrote a piece that was published today in the Atlantic, which says also that LBJ himself is an enormous topic, right? He has a very long political career that precedes the presidency. He and Lady Bird were devoted to stuffing the LBJ library with as much material as possible. You know, their, 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 their bias is toward access and documentation. You talked about her documenting her presidency, her involvement in the presidency and also documenting herself doing that. The two LBJs were, were copious collectors of documentation, one secretly, the other one openly in terms of the tapes. So there's a lot of material to get through for anybody that wants to take on any aspect of Johnson and the LBJ presidency. But I also think it has to do with, you know, just kind of a baked in assumption that that careful controlled public image that Lady Bird put out and constructed for herself because it was careful and it was controlled was all that met the eye. And that I think is a matter of socialization and biases and uh, sort of a, a kind of gendered worldview that we need to get over. And it will start overcoming it as we see more women in positions of power. She worked hard to document the power she had, but she also concealed it with, with, with clarity about wanting us to know it at the same time. So she covered all of those bases. <laughs> it's, it's a really fascinating paradox. Um, and I wonder if, if both of you, and, and please, um, you know, both of you weigh in on these questions. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about why, I mean, what was behind the, the, document, the, the, the documentary impulse, we can call it that. Um, I mean, clearly, Julia, as, as you've described, Lady Bird had been playing this role with her husband. This didn't start when he became president. She had, you know, been right. advising him clearly on political questions going back probably to the, to the beginning. I mean, even before he had first won that special election to the House in 1937. And so, and yet, as far as we know, and Claudia, tell us if, if, if you have any indication otherwise, she didn't begin to write these kinds of diaries or make these sorts of recordings until right after Dallas, 1963. Isn't that right? Um, why, why then? Well, I, I think it was because they assumed the presidency and she knew how important it was going to be. And you've got to remember her education was as a uh, a historian and a journalist. And I think that she immediately saw the importance of this record when they assumed the presidency and that that's why she started. And I, I think it was just part of her nature. She, she knew this needed to be done. I, I wanna jump in and ask Claudia because I haven't asked the library officially for a while, but you know, she, she, I came across something actually sort of late in my process of writing the book and doing the podcast. As a trained journalist, she always had with her these small little spiral notebooks that she took notes into. Mm -hmm. And we hear in episode one, but generally in the interviews that Jackie Kennedy did with Arthur Schlesinger Jr., she talks about being sort of taken aback that Lady Bird could sort of carry on a conversation with whomever was sitting next to her, but across the room, she's listening to Lyndon's conversation and taking notes in one of these little small notebooks. She had those notebooks with her. And as I understand it, there are notebooks that precede the presidency that haven't yet been processed. And how far do they go back? And am I accurate about that, Claudia? We do have notebooks. I don't know how far they go back. And I can't tell you offhand what the volume is, I do know that a lot of the information in them is in shorthand. Right. <laughs> Making and it even are, more difficult. And there are not very many people around anymore that can actually read uh, Greg's shorthand, which is what she used. So uh, there will be a problem make <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> for historians to use those. 
But just to bring it home to this matter of her conscientiousness around documenting, she mm-hmm. had those notebooks with her in her purse on Air Force One flying back from Dallas to Washington and had the, the presence of mind and ability to sit there and take notes. Mm-hmm about what she had just experienced. So when we hear that first entry, which about November 22nd, she recorded it eight days after the assassination. As Claudia said, she's pulling together. I I haven't seen what's in the envelope for that first entry, but she's pulling together primary source material that she herself has created along with all this other secondary material. It's, It's a kind of a stunning capacity to have the clarity of mind to narrate a first draft from disparate sources on the fly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what the, it's that cliche about journalism, right? That it's the first draft of history. I mean, she was really in in a sense, literally writing the first draft of history right there, you know, as it was happening in that moment. And I wonder, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. A lot of the notes that she took ended up in those envelopes. Um, and uh, for example, the notes that I put on the screen, we found that in the envelope for March 4th. I mean, I'm sorry, for uh, March 7th, 1964. And uh, so uh, some of those, you might talk about notebooks, but I think a lot of the pages were torn out and actually ended up in envelopes or other places uh, too in addition to having intact in, uh, uh, tablets. Claudia, this makes me want to ask you, sorry, Jeff. Um, no, no, this is, <laughs> this is your time. <laughs> because I think uh, one of the people in the audience tonight is Barbara Klein, who was at the library working very much with Claudia and helping me a great deal when I was doing my research. And I think I remember a conversation when I asked Barbara if, if I could see the envelopes, you know, could I see the, the primary source material that created? And I think the answer was those aren't processed either. Are those envelopes for anybody that wants to keep going? I mean, that's a, that would be a great deal of fun to dive into. Are they uh, now processed? They are not processed. Um, they are still at the library unprocessed and, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Barbara Klein. The library owes her a great deal of uh, gratitude for processing material and uh, and helping researchers to uh, to use it. Here, here. Well, and I I want to come back to uh, something that both of you have touched on in the last several minutes, and that is that clearly Lady Bird um, was thinking about history when she was taking these notes and making these recordings. And, and I, I wonder if, if you can both speak to this question of Lady Bird's work uh, in advancing the, the Johnson legacy. I mean, clearly she was, and there are even some comments that she makes along the way in terms of how history will perceive her husband and his work, um, the work of the administration. She ended up, as as we know, she ended up outliving LBJ by more than forty years. Um, was she very involved in in the work of of the library and the archives, and and also just more generally in uh, working to shape, uh, as these diaries do, the way that 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 we all understand LBJ and his and his time in office. Um. I would say yes and no. I don't think she was really involved in the day-to-day operations of the library so much as encouraging people to do things like give oral histories to the library or give their papers to the library. And she also did um, a large number of oral histories herself, which we have at the library and they are great. Her oral histories largely document the pre-presidential period because we had her diaries for the presidential period. Um, I do think she was interested in his legacy. Obviously she was, but I think she also, I I would not want people to have the impression that she interfered with the processing of papers or anything like that at the library. She was always very supportive of making things available. Uh, For example, the telephone conversations. Uh, that that Johnson recorded. 
Well, Julie, I, I have one um, closing question for you here. Um, looks like we're, we're almost at the end of our hour. And um, maybe to bring it all together for us, um, you, you've made a really compelling case in the book um, that this changes, as you put it, it changes our understanding of, of Lyndon Johnson and what they call their presidency. Um, and I wonder if, if you could, um, if you could give us your sense of, I mean, how did it change your understanding? Let's, let's start with that, your understanding of Johnson's presidency, whatever you thought about it um, as you went into this project and, and where you ended up. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, you know, I think from my days working in and writing about foreign policy and being a student of American diplomatic history, my own training was a little bit what I described before, which is, you know, we focus on the president, we focus on the national security staff or broadening it out. If you think about the LBJ presidency, you took, one thinks about his two major uh, components, on the one hand, civil, civil rights and, and great society, on the other hand, Vietnam, um, and kind of his overarching personality. And around personality, the, the historiography has focused very much on LBJ and his exercise of power that word power is very much associated with, with that particular president. So my own pre-existing notions were to think about the presidency as this kind of, uh, I don't want to sound cliche at all here, but just kind of, you know, a boys club and a boys club with a, a big boy at the center. Um, but re taking Lady Bird's story of the presidency and placing it into that context and placing her very much in the room. She talks about being in the room all the time. Um, the photos and the images show it. Just makes me think of it as a much more of a shared project. And, um, and of course, I think the, a problem with the American presidency, and we see this even in real time with American presidents in the White House, is that, you know, the, the single individual American president often complains once they're in there that they don't have that much power, that, you know, this is necessarily a collaboration between three powers, certainly across cabinets and interagencies. We heard Obama talk all the time about feeling a little bit limited in his powers. So, so I think it's caused me to, to broaden out the definition of power where, we, where a president derives his or her power and where, where resources a president draws upon for that power. And that's where this particular first lady, Lady Bird Johnson comes in. And I, I think we'll see this in the future. And I think we can go back and revisit more recent presidencies through that lens of power more broadly defined. Well, and, and clearly there was a center of power in that Johnson White House that, that we didn't know enough about. Um, so I, we're, we're grateful to Lady Bird for keeping a record of that, which not every subsequent First Lady will have done. And we're grateful to you, Julia, for bringing all this to light and really changing uh, again on the part, speaking on behalf of a lot of us who spent a lot of time working on thinking about the, the Johnson presidency, this, this really um, casts a lot of things in, in a different light, a richer light, and it's a fantastic book. And uh, thank you for talking with us about it here today. Thank you, Claudia, for adding your perspective um, from being at the, the, the center of uh, operations there in Austin. Um, and I just wanna say before we wrap up that um, uh, for all of you who out there who are interested in buying this book, and I hope many of you do, um, there are some signed copies available that you can uh, that you can order at the Johnson Library. Um, I think if I've got the uh, the website right, it's lbjstore.com. Um, I think there's a discount right now, and the discount code is Claudia, appropriately <laughs> enough. So you've been honored with the discount code, which is not something that many of us can claim. Um, so uh, I wanna thank both of you again um, and congratulations again, Julia, on this tremendous book. And thank you very much. It's getting. It's wonderful to be here with both of you and Jeff, thanks so much for moderating a great 
evening and Claudia again wonderful to have you here with us and thanks for everything you've done thank you thanks very much all right good night everybody good night good night